Right now, we have the wonderful topic of fintech in ASEAN 2020. Get up, reset, go. For this session, we have four amazing speakers. Atal Leong, Senior Vice President, United Overseas Bank. Wan Yi Wong, Fintech Leader, PwC Singapore. Kono McMahon, Senior Manager, APEC AWM Markets Research Centre, PwC Singapore. Chia Hock Lai, President, Singapore Fintech Association, to share with us. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the launch of the 2020 Fintech in ASEAN report, titled Get Up, Reset, Go. This report is a collaboration between UOB, the Singapore Fintech Association, and PwC Singapore. In today's event, we'll highlight some of the report's key findings and go over some of the key points with the report stakeholders. So, without further ado, let's examine what we found this year. Joining me now to go over some of those key findings in more detail are Wani Wong, the head of fintech at PwC Singapore, Arthur Lung, senior VP at UOB, who focuses on fintech investments and digital engagement, and Cha Hotfly, chairman of the Singapore Fintech Association. Wani, we'll start with you. What are some of the key trends this year with regards to fintech fundraising and deals across Asia? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Connell. A very good evening and good morning to all of you, depending on where you're dialing in from. Yeah, so we are actually really excited to have this at the second year, partnering with our key partners, UOB and SFA, looking at fintech ecosystem. So I'll just kickstart first, and then I'll hand it over to Arthur and then Hotline. Um, so I took the chapter one, Get Up. I really just wanted to share with all of you in terms of the overall deals and funding. Um, this year, as we speak, um, I'm sure all of you agree, it's a very interesting year, uh, which no one would have been able to imagine how it has turned out. Um, so with the pandemic, geopolitical tensions, and slowing gro global economy, I, I see that new priorities have been pushed to the forefront. So there are winners and there are losers, but we see some plans being fast-tracked and others being disrupted. So I would say one of the best things that came out of this is accelerated digital adoption. I think it's great news for many of you here, the fintechs, which are in the digital industries. So just wanted to give you a very quick overview of funding. Maybe I can go to the next slide. Yeah, so as we started the white paper this year, we took a look at the ASEAN states. Um, so meaning Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, then and Vietnam. We took a look at how we have performed in 2020 up to the third quarter. So the results, as you can see, from the year, but 2020 as three months, nine months. So what you can see, see in funding this year uh, as the last uh, bar chart, uh, bar, bar graph in the first chart, we also observe some green shoots of growth, actually. Um, as you can see, not surprising, we 
we see that the, the total amount of funding in this year, 2020, year to date, it's about 900 million compared to the good threshold of 1.12 billion in 2019. But without, but without that negative kind of a conversation, what it's good for us to actually focus on is actually we are already better than 2018 and we actually do see green shoots of growth. So maybe if I can move on to the next slide. Singapore continued to attract the most funding. This is kind of the common, common thing that we have mentioned uh, year on year. And it has maintained its established leadership in ASEAN fintech landscape. Indonesia actually moved up to second position this year while maintaining a stable share of ASEAN fintech funding. The change in ranking for Indonesia to become second, it's actually mainly due to the fact that Vietnam had a very chunky deal last year, mainly for VNP, a US 300 million deal. If I can move to the next slide as well, in terms of the numbers of deals, we noticed that three of every five deals in ASEAN went to Singapore-based Singapore -based firms. And interestingly, Q2 saw the highest number of deals. So we saw 44 um, deals that happened during Q2 despite very strict movement restriction around ASEAN. As some of you may know in Singapore, that was also when we had the circuit breaker. In terms of the deals, we noted that payment is by far the most funded vertical in 2020. Um, payments firms actually receive about US 470 million so far for the nine months. And payments do look set to benefit from the growth of digital commerce and changing consumer behavior post COVID-19. So maybe if I can also move on to the next slide. Yep. Um, while, we, while we see that the ASEAN fintech ecosystem continues to grow, uh, we noted that in the main hubs, uh, which you can see in the red, light blue and um, brown, brown colored graph, which would be Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia, the number of fintechs is actually growing at a slow pace. I mean, it's still growing, but it's a bit slower and we do think that it's likely due to COVID-19 impact. And I, I feel that it's a sign of maturity of the ecosystem. Why do I say so? Because I do think that ecosystem is now more focused on proven players rather than the number of players. So as you can see from on the next slide, um, we could see that we could see that there are actually fewer deals, but definitely higher funding amounts. Uh, one of the VC that we interviewed referred to referred this to uh, K shaped recovery. Uh, which is what we are focused on. We do think that as we recover from this pandemic and economic situation, more well-run funds actually will see better valuation, while firms at the opposite spectrum will see a tougher challenge in attracting investment dollars. Can I have the next slide? We will then actually hand it over to Arta um, to then take a look at how um, deeper dive into how the fintechs actually navigated through this pandemic um, and to continue with our observation of this K-shaped recovery. Arthur, please. Thank you, Wani. Um, so in the next couple of moments, I hope to share uh, some of the key survey findings. Um, we conducted a survey with many, many fintechs. Uh, we sent out a, a survey to more than 1,000 a, a uh, respondents. Um, and we got actually 109 uh, responses uh, to our survey. Um, it was conducted in the midst of the circuit breaker and respondents told us that the areas of, sorry, can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, so respondents told us that the area of human resources, uh, business growth and existing projects and proof of concepts were least affected. Understandably so, as everyone stayed put in their jobs and they were shut, the shutting down of economies and borders turned out not to be so bad as it stoked increased interest in fintech solutions. Existing projects were even accelerated in some instances. Cash flow, customer acquisition and profitability were the most negatively affected and many fintech firms look for ways to better manage costs and be more efficient. Existing VC investors also stepped in as they were eager to protect their portfolio companies 
And besides additional financing, they also helped with operational reviews, restructuring, and encouraged collaboration with other portfolio companies. Can we move on to the next slide? Our second finding was that payments, uh, IDA and cybersecurity were areas seen as benefiting most from the pandemic. Payments took the lion's share at 61%, no surprises with the lockdowns driving consumers to transact and do businesses online. AIDA was the next big one, as most felt that widespread enterprise use of AI could reap the twin benefits of increased revenue and cost reduction. And thirdly, cybersecurity is also another promising area of fintech in Asia, as the collection, use, and sharing of data will become more prevalent with increased online economic activity. Yeah, the next slide, please. So our third finding was that early stage fintech firms were perceived to be more negatively impacted by the pandemic at 58% versus later stage fintechs at 38%, as investors turned cautious and preferred quality assets with a clearer path to profitability and some level of regulatory certainty. Later stage FinTech also had the benefit of a set of valuations and strategic investor support from previous funding round. While there may have been a slowdown in high quality deals earlier in 2020, this was also attributed to better quality firms holding off on additional fundraising at this time because they wanted to avoid depressing their valuation. Early stage deals are still happening but are somewhat delayed due to the inability to do face-to-face -face due diligence for the first time. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we have observed in our fourth finding was that firms with a vintage of less than two years, almost 86% of them, preferred equity financing over other forms of fundraising, such as debt or convertible notes. Younger fintechs preferred strategic investors with skin in the game who were able to give a real boost in terms of quality advice and connections early on. Preference towards equity financing starts to ease off as fintech firms become more established. In fact, we observed that there was an increase in firms having no preference in the type of financing as they mature from two years to five and beyond. Founders are more averse to dilution of ownership as the business grows over time. And let's move on to the fifth finding. So COVID-19 hasn't seriously dampened FinTech's regional expansion plans. As you look at the funnel below, only 21% are putting them on hold, while 79% are going ahead with their expansion plans. Of these, ASEAN was a top market to enter at 78%, followed by APAC at 59%. The results were mostly similar regardless of whether the fintech were headquartered in ASEAN or outside ASEAN. So with open-minded regulators, a large unbanked population, growing internet and smartphone penetration, and a rising middle class, ASEAN is now high on the radar for fintechs looking to enter new markets. And now we move on to our final conclusion. Looking forward to the next 12 months, FinTech firms will focus on the top blue horizontal bars, which are all revenue growth related activities, such as product innovation, zooming in on high revenue products and segments, entering new markets, or pivoting to a new line of business. What comes next is getting external support via additional funding from investors, salary support, relief measures from the government, or through m and activity. As you can see in the chart, many FinTech firms have already taken the past few months to reassess their business operations, to downsize, to become leaner, and to position themselves for the eventual recovery. So I have this to say to the fintechs, get up, reset, and go fintech. Thank you. So now I hand it over to Oklai. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, next slide. The rise of uh, digital banks in the uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia bode well for the industry. Fintechs are more likely to collaborate than build from scratch. For some of them, they will even buy, such as the AMTD group. Digital banks also catalyze the digital transformation of incumbents. Example, NTC Enterprise and Standard Charter Bank. 
announced that they are also working on the standalone digital bank. And one of the local banks are also creating one of their own outfit. They too will be likely to work with fintechs. In short, digital banks will make the landscape more vibrant as they become an additional source of partnerships to fintechs and even catalyze other financial institutions to partner with other fintech companies. On the other hand, digital banks would compete for market share and talent too with other fintech companies. Overall, the end consumers and businesses will benefit both in the short and long run from higher saving deposit rates to lower loan interest rates. Most importantly, a better customer experience. While Singapore is the first to launch a digital banking licensing regime, Malaysia already announced their own framework last year. Philippines just announced their own digital banking framework. Their ecosystems will experience similar excitement as Singapore. But some advantages will accrue to the Singapore digital bank uh, successful applicants due to the first mover advantage and the credibility premium as a Singapore licensed digital bank. Medium to longer term, I see the ASEAN region becoming more vibrant as growth returns post-pandemic. The regional comprehensive economic partnership will also catalyze more growth within Asia and in particular ASEAN, especially with the focus of reorganizing of global supply chain to be shorter to increase resiliency. Both incumbents and innovators will benefit from an enlarged economic pie. Thank you. Over to you, Connor. Excellent. Thank you all for those insights. Uh, and again, at this time, I'd also like to reach out and thank all the survey participants uh, who enabled us to come up with the findings for this report uh, and all the fintechs and the venture capital firms that we interviewed uh, in order to gain their insights as well. Uh, for the audience, I hope that you enjoyed uh, the speakers and the insights that they provided. Uh, coming up on the next slide, you should see a QR code which you would be able to access the report through. Uh, feel free to scan that uh, and access the report. And if you'd like to reach out to any of the speakers or any of those involved in the creation of this report across UOB, PwC or SFA, uh, you will find their contact details within the report so that you can reach out to them as well. Uh, thank you again for watching, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of Singapore Fintech Festival 2020.